we're going to turn back to the 18th anniversary of the disaster of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Our Lane Lucky is on standby at the uh, museum where we just watched that ceremony take place. Lane, good morning. And good morning, Jeremy. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I, the signal was a little weak at a moment ago. Gotcha. You sound good. You look good. Okay, great. We're inside the Patricia Huffman Smith NASA Museum, remembering Columbia here in Hemp Hill. And uh, again, as you just saw just a bit ago, the annual memorial service held for the seven astronauts who lost their lives that day, February 1st, 2003, and the two crew members uh, of the rescue uh, and search and rescue, I should say, the recovery operation that happened in the months following um, Charles Krennic and Buzz Meir died in a helicopter crash here uh, nearby in Sabine County, looking for parts of the shuttle Columbia and the remains of the crew members. So they are honored alongside the fallen astronauts each year. So just kind of going back to the nuts and bolts of actually what happened, um, how, what, what caused the space shuttle to actually explode? Sure, and it broke apart upon re-entry, but the problem started at liftoff. Let me show you a scale model of the shuttle here inside, again, the museum. You can see the space shuttle. Many of us, of course, uh, growing up, knew much about these, or at least recognized uh, the, the shape of the shuttle. Much like a, a space plane or an airplane, it would launch like a rocket and come back into the Earth's atmosphere, much like uh, a, a plane. However, it didn't have any engines that could cause it to fly here on Earth, uh, so it was a glider, really. So it launches upright like this. The day of the launch, uh, there's a large external fuel tank a fuel tank uh, covered in foam. The liquid inside the fuel, the propellants are super cooled. And so that causes the exterior of that foam covered tank to get very, very cold, very brittle. A piece of foam about the size of a suitcase came off and hit the leading edge, the left leading edge here of the wing. And that caused uh, a hole to form. They saw it um, and studied it, but kind of determined that it, it may not pose a threat. There really was no way to address the issue um, at, at the time, so they debated whether to tell the crew of the problem. But again, there was a, a suitcase-sized hole in the wing, and this material, this is another scale model of it. It's called reinforced carbon-carbon. It's very lightweight, but it's very sturdy. Um, so again, I can pick this up, but it is very, very sturdy, um, even though it uh, was susceptible to the foam strike. On re-entry, the surface of the vehicle, the surface of the, the space shuttle heats up. Uh, the gases, the friction caused those gases to get very hot. Well, it got inside the hole, um, which is designed the leading edge and the outside of the space shuttle is covered in a thermal protection system. Places are tiles that can get really hot. Um, but the inside of the shuttle isn't designed to withstand that kind of heat. And so the gases got inside and caused the structure of the shuttle to fail and break apart. And that caused it to disintegrate. So a lot of people think that the shuttle um, maybe exploded, but it did, it broke apart. It was more of a disintegration. And that sound caused reverberations. It broke the sound barrier and they heard those sonic booms. So the, the loud booms they heard were not exactly explosions, but the sound of the pieces of that breaking the sound barrier. So what exactly was the mission they, that they were on or coming back from actually? Sure. So this was the Space Shuttle Columbia. That's the name of the spacecraft. Its designation was STS-107, Shuttle Transportation System, mission number 107. And at the time in 2003, we were still constructing the International Space Station, but Columbia was the very first space shuttle. Its first launch was in 1981, in April of 1981. This is the 40th year uh, since the very uh, first space shuttle launch. Um, but uh, 
it was too heavy and and not designed to be able to go to the International Space Station. It didn't have the docking adapter that the other space shuttle uh, orbiters did. So this was a purely science mission. And here in the museum, um, you actually will get to learn about not only STS-107, which was the final flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia, but you'll learn about all 28 of the Space Shuttle uh, Columbia missions. Let me walk across and I'll just take you kind of on a quick tour of where it begins. So again, it starts with STS-1. And throughout the museum, you'll see these panels that tell you a little bit about the crew, tell you a little bit about what their objectives were for the mission, and any highlights. So Columbia's very first mission in 1981 featured astronauts John Young and Bob Crippen. John Young actually walked on the moon in one of the final moon missions, and he actually was the first to fly uh, the space shuttle. He was the, the commander of STS-1. But it takes you through each of these panels throughout the main gallery of the museum here in Hemphill, each of the uh, each of the Columbia missions. And actually, let me take you over here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Charlie Bolden, uh, he was the director of NASA in the previous administration. That's actually U.S. Senator Bill Nelson, uh, who left Congress uh, in in the last term. And we even have an East Texas astronaut. This is Dr. Byron Lichtenberg. He teaches at Letourneau University in Longview. He was NASA's very first payload specialist, and he actually spoke at a uh, museum gala uh, last year uh, before the pandemic. But again, it takes you through all of Columbia's 28 missions and tells you a little bit about those, of course, ending here with the final flight, STS-107, which launched in January of 2003, and of course broke apart in the skies over East Texas. So beyond um, explaining the mission, uh, it also tells the story of the search and recovery effort. If we go around the corner here, this gallery tells you a lot about that recovery effort. And this is where so many of our East Texas viewers will see their personal connection because they found something in their yard, on their property. They volunteered for the search and recovery effort. They fed the volunteers. We're talking 20, 30,000 people from around the country descended upon East Texas within a matter of weeks. This was the largest land-based search and rescue effort in, in world history, in history. The Columbia recovery was the largest land-based search and recovery effort in history. So this map up here that you're kind of showing us right now, this red streak across the map, is that where they found debris or? Yes, remains? you're exactly right. This is the scene um, that most people probably remember. If they looked up in the sky that morning, that, that cold, February morning, they saw the streaks of light, and those were pieces of debris, those were pieces of the shuttle breaking apart um, and, and streaking across the sky. And this actually shows the path that not only the shuttle was taking, but when it started to break apart. And you can see it even plots here on this map all of the places where debris were, were located. All the way from the Texas Panhandle into southwestern Louisiana, and even into South Central Louisiana. And this takes it even um, closer. And you can see really the majority of the debris was found from the Palestine area all the way into Hemp Hill here along the shores of Toledo Bend Reservoir. So roughly how long, you said it was the largest uh, search and recovery uh, effort in history. How long did it roughly take to, to recover everything that needed to be recovered? months, months and months. So in the end, about 38 to 40 percent of the Space Shuttle Columbia's total weight was recovered in East Texas. And you can see at the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, they actually took the pieces of debris and tried to identify what they were and where they would have been located in the footprint of the, the layout of the shuttle. So only about 40 percent, less less than half of the shuttle was ever recovered, and and again, 
25 to 30,000 people, most of them volunteers, um, took part in this recovery effort. And Hemp Hill kind of was the epicenter of that. Uh, you can see how the VFW here in Sabine County and the, the rodeo arena was turned into a staging area and they fed all of those volunteers for months and months and months that followed. And it was a trying time, not only for the volunteers, but for the community because they, without ever being asked, stepped up and, and answered this call to serve, to help and to bring the astronauts home to their families. So moving beyond the actual, you know, disaster and the recovery efforts, what's the legacy of Columbia on space travel, on NASA, on protocols, things like this? Certainly. And as you may have heard in the memorial service a bit ago, the husband of Laurel Clark, one of the mission specialists, uh, Jonathan Clark, said that if one child or one person was inspired to believe that they, despite their situation or their background, could pursue um, a passion for a career, a future in uh, space exploration, in the STEM field and technology, then his wife's death was not in vain. And the families of the astronauts do believe that. The legacy is tangibly what you see here in Hemp Hill, this museum, which is not only dedicated to telling the history, but looking forward to the future and taking on that mission to inspire the next generation of astronauts to let East Texas children know that despite maybe being from a rural area, they have just as good a shot as becoming an astronaut, walking on the moon, being the first man or woman to walk on the surface of Mars. And so it, it really is about this locally in a grand scale. There was a lot that was learned um, about safety, not only for space flight, but so much science, so much was taken from the investigation that continues to make space travel safer, that continues to uh, make commercial aviation safer. Uh, they, they really were able to use this tragedy and, and learn from it uh, again so that this was not just a, a moment in, in the past. So have we seen other disasters like this in, in subsequent uh, space flights or was that going to be like the last one that we saw and they've been able to keep things relatively safer since then? Things have been safer since then. Uh, of course, uh, President George W. Bush made the decision following uh, the Columbia disaster after a pause of a couple of years um, to finish construction of the International Space Station and then retire the space shuttle. Uh, two disasters, of course, in its history, uh, the Challenger in 1986, which we just saw the 35th anniversary last week, and in 2003, the uh, Columbia disaster and tragedy here in East Texas, um, they decided that we needed to move on to uh, a different mode of transportation for American astronauts. And you just saw that. Uh, this past summer, of course, we saw the return to flight for an American spacecraft. And now SpaceX and Boeing are producing spacecraft that will take American astronauts into low Earth orbit. And then, of course, you have the Artemis program and the Orion spacecraft, which is being developed by NASA, which will, again, do the same. Very familiar to the era of uh, Apollo as far as it being a capsule. It's not a space plane like the space shuttle but it's more of a, a capsule design, though much larger than what we saw in the Apollo era. Well, Lane, is there I mean, something that I haven't asked about yet that you feel is like important information? Absolutely, um, it, and, it, and it has to do with the museum here. Again, it, it is certainly honoring the past, but their focus is on the future. If you've never made the drive here to Hemp Hill, it is certainly worth your time. You can spend five minutes here, you can spend five hours here, and you will have uh, likely an opportunity to talk with people who remember this, who have a firsthand connection. Uh, of course, the, the curator of the museum, Belinda Gay, uh, she and her husband 
Uh, he was the commander of the uh, VFW at the time, but they helped feed all of those people and create a staging area during the recovery process. Sabine County that day promised that their mission, there being the Columbia crew, would become our mission. It's uh, even become an unofficial motto here for the community, that they would keep Columbia's legacy alive. And again, you'll learn about Space Shuttle Columbia and all of its missions, but this is hallowed ground. Um, within just a few miles radius, the remains of all seven of the astronauts were located here in Sabine County in the Hemp Hill area. And so the families have a special connection to this place as well. And because of that relationship, they have donated um, personal items and, and artifacts. Let me show you this gallery here. There's a display case for each of the seven astronauts and again, the two volunteers who uh, perished in, in the, uh, the Columbia tragedy, but it contains personal items, things that they've gotten calls from the Smithsonian asking, we'd love to have these in our museum. And the family members have said it, it needs to remain here in East Texas, here in Hemp Hill. This is Rick Husband's display case. He was the commander that you heard about in the uh, in the, uh, the memorial program. These were his contact lenses that he took with him on STS-107. And this is one of the items that was recovered in the debris here. Um, something so small remained intact, really just uh, uh, amazing. And you learn a lot about who they were as people and why science, why STEM was important to them and why science education is important. Kalt Nachala, she was the first um, person of Indian descent to fly in space. And uh, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, received her master's degree um, here in Texas. Um, and her family has donated this uh, beautiful uh, dress, her favorite uh, dress from India. And so you'll learn a little bit about each of the astronauts here um, and, and some of the, the things that they held near and dear to them. There's also, really interestingly, an amazing space shuttle simulator where you can take the controls of the space shuttle and land it yourself. So I'll take you inside the cockpit. Now it's turned off right now because this is an off limits area at the moment due to COVID. Obviously it's a confined space, but it really is amazing that this gives you an idea of exactly what the space shuttle cockpit looked like. And you can sit in the seat and when the computers are turned on, you'll actually be able to take the controls and try and land the space shuttle yourself. And it really is uh, uh, so amazing to be able to step inside and look around at what the astronauts would have used and what they would have seen as they spent up to two weeks in space. So this is a, a, a learning center, a place for school children of all ages and for adults. Uh, there's also a, a theater where you saw the memorial service take place um, where a documentary is uh, displayed uh, and you can watch that. There's also items um, that were used in training and flown in space. The tiles that would have been on the outside of the space shuttle and astronaut food. You can learn a little bit about what they would eat in space. Yes, those are M&Ms. But it really is uh, just a, a place to come and learn and reflect. Well, Lane, we appreciate, of course, you showing us around and kind of giving us your own uh, level of expertise to kind of go along with uh, the, the exhibits and the, the displays there. And uh, again, just a, a, big, a big thank you to, to, to you for your time and, uh, and what you've offered here today. Glad to do it. Again, the Patricia Huffman Smith NASA Museum is open Tuesdays through Saturdays, and they're open from 10 until 5. They love hosting school groups and can still do that here during, um, you know, COVID restrictions with a little planning. And they do special tours on Mondays by appointment only. So if you've never been here to Hemp Hill to the museum, you should put this on your bucket list immediately. Okay. Well, Lane, again, thanks so much. Um, have a great day out there. Stay safe when you come back, and we'll talk to you soon. 
Jeremy, thanks a lot. Thank you.